recording. Okay. Welcome, everyone. This is the online MCS admissions webinar. Um, let's see. We have, we'll do a quick round of introductions, and then we'll jump into some slides that we have um, to present, and then we can do a Q&A afterwards. But you can always drop your questions in the Q&A forum, and um, please drop them in that Q&A versus the chat box. It's easier for us to find your questions and answer them there. So, uh, John and Vivica, if you want to go first with introductions. Sure, thanks, Christine. Um, my name is John Hart. I'm a professor in uh, the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Illinois. I'm also the Director of Online and Professional Programs for the Department of Computer Science and also the Executive Associate Dean of the Graduate College here. Uh, welcome, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Viveka Kudavigam. I'm the Assistant Director for Computer Science Graduate Programs. Um, have been in the department for about five years on campus for a lot longer than that. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Martinez. I'm an academic advisor for the online MCS. Okay, and I just saw someone log in from Tanzania. That's pretty oh, cool. Oh, wow. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my desktop. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay, excellent. So again, this is an online MCS admissions webinar. I'm going to move on to the second slide. And uh, welcome and thanks for joining us. Um, today's topics that we're going to get covered, um, we're just going to go over application requirements, both for domestic and international student applications, um, tuition and financial aid. We'll go over the FAQ that we have posted on our website, um, and then application deadlines and where to find information. Next slide, what are we looking for? Um, John, I think you'd be the best one to talk about this slide. Great, Th thanks, thanks, Christine. So welcome, um, this is uh, the application seminar for the Master of Computer Science degree at the University of Illinois, offered by the Computer Science Program. It's a top five program in computer science, ranked quite highly. And uh, we also offer a specialization in that degree called the Master of Computer Science in Data Science which is really a track of courses that satisfy the, the uh, Master of Computer Science, but focus on data sciences. Um, University of Illinois is a, a land grant institution. It was founded by something called the Morrill Act that uh, was designed to, um, uh, to meet the needs of, uh, of growing industry uh, demand um, at the time in the areas of the mechanical um, arts and agriculture. Um, but if you bring that to modern times, uh, the biggest industry needs right now are in computer science and data science. And so we are uh, quite um, uh, uh, pleased to be able to partner with Coursera to use their scalable education platform to be able to deliver this uh, degree online to more students than we ever have been before. Uh, the, the, the program has already grown to be the second largest one we've ever had at the University of Illinois. So it's, it's been quite successful. So this is a Master of Computer Science uh, degree. Um, you can, you can uh, also get the MCS uh, DS if you want to specialize in data sciences. What we find is we get a large number of applications both from students with a computer science undergraduate degree, but also students um, with an undergraduate degree outside of computer science. Um, often it's a close, closely related area like electrical engineering or uh, communications technology, or, um, or, or other, uh, other areas related to computing, uh, but often it's in completely um, uh, far-flung areas that, um, that are a bit farther away from computer science. Areas like psychology and, uh, and the sciences and other engineering disciplines like uh, aerospace, um, uh, areas of the humanity like history or English, um, even medicine and law and others uh, uh, have pursued the uh, MCS degree. The, the modern Master of Computer Science is, is very much like an MBA. And often you would see people get a bachelor's degree in some disciplinary area and then add an MBA on top of that to show that they've got uh, uh, skills uh, in taking that disciplinary area and then and being able to, uh, uh, to do management in that area with a business administration uh, degree. The MCS is much the same um, sends much the same signal for computer science. And so we get a lot of students come in with a bachelor's degree in these other areas and add an MCS on top of that 
in order to uh, show that they've got skills at um, um, applying computer science, data science to that particular discipline. So it's a very much a multidisciplinary um, uh, uh, group of cohort of students that we get in this degree, but it is a computer science uh, degree and so it will involve a significant amount of programming and we, uh, we go to great uh, effort to make sure that everybody that's admitted to this degree has all of the prerequisite knowledge, all of the uh, information and, and skills and uh, background that they need in order to succeed at the degree. Um, we want to see every single student we admitted complete the degree uh, and graduate uh, um, uh, in, in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, we, we try to safeguard against, against that. So some of the requirements for the degree, uh, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Um, that's, a, that's a university regulation. We can't give a master's degree without a bachelor's degree. Um, that represents kind of the uh, breadth of what a bachelor's degree would represent in, uh, in just basic uh, um, uh, fundamentals of, uh, of education. Um, we also um, have a GPA requirement. Our baseline requirement is a 3.2 GPA out of a 4.0 scale. Um, that, uh, um, uh, but we, we do a, a number of different ways of looking at the GPAs of our applicants. Uh, we will look at your uh, total GPA from your bachelor's degree. Uh, often students are coming to us with a variety of different uh, um, transcripts from different institutions on their way to their bachelor's or even after their bachelor's. And so we look at each of those. Uh, we'll look at the total GPA. We'll also look at your GPA in the last two years. We'll also look at your GPA of your computer science courses, and we'll also look at the GPA of your most recent courses that you've taken, especially if you've taken some, some um, additional courses uh, after your degree. So um, uh, that's to say we, we employ holistic methods in evaluating the application. We look at everything you send to us and try to give each student every possible uh, benefit to, uh, um, to being admitted. Um, but at the same time, we have to make sure that uh, um, students coming in can maintain the uh, GPA average needed for good uh, uh, standing in our, in our program. Um, uh, at the graduate level, you're expected to get an A in your classes, maybe a B plus or a B. But um, in grad, uh, at the graduate level, getting a C is like getting an F at the undergraduate level. So um, the, the, the expectations are quite a bit higher. Um, the, the main thing we're looking for in our applicants is, uh, is the background uh, in computer science. You'll be taking coursework in, uh, at the graduate level in a top five computer science program. So it's, uh, it requires a lot of fundamental computer science knowledge in order to be able to uh, keep up with uh, uh, the topics that, uh, that we teach at the graduate level. So um, those prerequisites are in the area of data structures. Uh, in the area of algorithms, in the area of object-oriented programming and design, in the area of linear algebra, and then some basic uh, statistics and probability. Um, and uh, uh, often uh, a lot of the students will come to us with a, a course in programming. Often it's a Python programming course, but they've had some coursework in programming and learned a programming language and, um, and how to articulate a program, get something good up and running. What we're really looking for then is that second course in computer programming. That second course is very often called data structures. And a data structures course will go over data structures and algorithms. It'll look at asymptotic uh, runtime analysis of those algorithms so that you know as the number of elements go up in your data structure, how the running time of your program is going to increase. And that's very important for modern computer programming, modern data science because we're no longer dealing with hundreds or thousands of elements. We're dealing with billions. Uh, we're at petascale levels of, um, of processing. Um, and so uh, you have very large data sets and it's very important to know which algorithms are appropriate when the uh, number of elements gets, gets very large. So we're looking for that uh, uh, coursework in data structures that will include algorithms, some exposure to an object oriented um, uh, programming language, a production programming language like C++ or Java, um, and then um, some understanding of linear algebra and stats and probability uh, is, is also very helpful. Students may struggle, for example, in our machine learning coursework 
um, and machine learning is a very important part of data science and computer science. Um, it's important to have that background in, in stats probability and linear algebra. Linear algebra is, uh, is dealing with matrices, uh, but especially large sparse matrices and different methods for solving matrices and using those to optimize various uh, um, programs. I'll stop there. Uh, any other issues on that slide that I should touch on or we can move on? I think we can move on. So the next slide will go over application requirements. Uh, let me let me do the left yes. side. Okay. Yeah. So um, for the application requirements, uh, one is you have to um, you have to submit an application. <laughs> Step one of Fight Club is uh, uh, submit your application. Uh, you have to submit an application, um, and that means um, you have to pay the application fee. And that application fee is seventy dollars for domestic students, ninety dollars for international students. There's a tremendous amount of work that happens uh, at the university to process these applications to make sure all of the uh, information that you're getting to us gets formatted properly so we can see the whole picture when we're evaluating the application. And so um, we have to have uh, those application fees help cover that. Um, and again, we have to clear some visa issues and other issues for our international applicants and, and do a really good job of, of processing those. Um, so it's important that you pay the application fee. Your application will not be evaluated. You'll get no decision. Um, your application is not submitted if you do not pay that application fee. So that application fee needs to be pay, paid on time at the time you file the application. Um, I just want to make sure everybody understands that because sometimes a student will submit an application, forget to pay the application fee, and then you've missed your opportunity to get into the program for that, uh, um, for that semester. Um, you have the opportunity to submit three letters of recommendation. Um, we will look at the letters of recommendation, but um, our uh, criteria for MCS admission is going to be your undergraduate degree, um, your GPA, and your prerequisites. Um, we'll refer to your letters of recommendation if they can help clarify some questions we have about those three, but if you've got those three well documented, the letters of recommendation are probably going to help uh, the application a whole lot. You do not have to submit any letters of recommendation. It's up to you if you want to submit a letter of recommendation. The letters of recommendation um, will be considered, but they're, they're by no means mandatory. Um, often it's good for the letters of recommendation to speak about your specific skills in programming. Um, uh, if you have a manager, um, it, uh, some, often uh, we'll see a letter of recommendation speaking in generalities, um, but if, if um, the letters of recommendation can speak specifically about uh, particular programs you've written and the details of those programs, those are the strongest letters of recommendation. But again, um, they're only going to be referred to if we have any question about the, uh, your undergraduate degree, your GPA, and your prerequisites. Um, uh, again, we'll also refer to your statement of purpose but um, only if we have some question on your application materials on the GPA undergraduate degree or, um, um, or prerequisites and same for your resume. It's good to have a resume in there but, and necessary for um, English proficiency. But uh, again, we'll be referring to that if there's any questions. Um, is that okay? You want to pick up from there? So I, I'm going to just go back to these letters of recommendation. There was a question when there are the letter writers will receive the link. And as, as soon as you submit their information into the system, they will receive that link. So that is that is separate from the time you pay, for example, the application fee. So as you continue to work to uh, work through your application, that link will be sent out. And it's this is why you would want to start that application sooner rather than later, so that it also gives your letter writers, if you're depending on those letters to be um, to submit those letters into the system by the deadline. Um, that's just a, that was just a question. And the CV and the resume, so Professor Hart already spoke about this. One thing that we want to emphasize is, especially if you are, um, if you're planning to ask for a waiver from language proficiency requirements based on your employment, we do need to see the full information on your resume. So for example, if you have worked for one of the large multinational companies, please tell us where you were located, because I could be working for Microsoft in 
any number of um, countries and we, we need to see where you were it's based on your location that the waiver is uh, um, approved so please make sure to put that information in your um, resume and to submit your resume um, and then um, so the transcripts which is an important part of your application we do not need your official transcripts at this phase when you are applying so if you have copies of your transcripts you can scan them if you can download an unofficial copy from your institution's website you can download those what we do need is complete and um, legible cleared copies of your transcripts so a full transcript would have which institution you were at what your degree program was if a degree has been awarded and what classes you have taken including <clears throat> I'm sorry, the class, the title, the grade you have earned, the number of credit hours if you had, if that is in, um, documented information, depending on where you're from, you may not have credit hours, but it could be a year long transcript. And that is fine because we will account for that. Um, and so make sure when you scan them that you can read it and that you can read all the information because if you cannot, then we will certainly not be able to read it. And we may, we may get back to you and say we need a um, complete or clear transcript, but it is to your advantage to submit this when you, at the time you initially submit the application because that allows us to review the applications in the first round rather than having to contact you. Um, if you are admitted, then the University of Illinois Graduate College requires official transcript, transcripts to be turned in. So you do have a little bit of a grace period in the first semester that you enroll. So the first semester, if you're admitted, even if your official transcript is not submitted, you can still register for classes and continue taking the classes in the first term. But then, for example, since we are looking at fall applications, sometime in September is when, where your deadline is to submit these official transcripts. We are no noting this especially for some of the applicants who may have had their um, undergraduate degrees or other degrees from outside the US where getting a transcript can be a, a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. So if you are in that situation, please um, plan to look for um, the official transcripts, start working on getting an official transcript, although you may not be asked to submit it until you are admitted into the program. But this just heads up that if it is taking time, then you might want to plan for that. Um, and then the next part is standardized tests. We get this question quite a lot. If you have GRE or GMAT, should you submit them? These are not required. So we would not consider them part of the review process. But if you have it, if you have Especially if you have taken GRE, you can just attach a copy, an electronic copy, a PDF copy to your application. There's no need to send official scores to right. us. Okay. Uh, we, will, we will take a look at them, but they're not a, a major factor in our decision. We will refer to them if we have some question on those other three matters, though. So this is different for students who have to take either TOEFL or IELTS to meet their language requirement. Those scores will have to be sent to the university officially through ETS. Um, in the application, you can attach a copy of the score report so that we can see it until the scores are reported to the university. But ultimately, this becomes part of your student record, so they have to be reported officially. And if you have any questions, you can also contact us at our central email address. We will share in a little bit. But those are, those are the uh, main elements of your application form. Okay, um, the next slide is going to go over additional requirements for international students. Oops, I skipped over a slide. Which we actually went over a little bit. Yep, here we go. But so, um, and there are some questions in the Q&A session too. What you would want to do is to look up your country on the graduate college and this the URL is um, on this screen. What the graduate college requires is a, is a bachelor's degree that is comparable to a bachelor's degree that is awarded by a US institution, and that is a four-year degree. 
So we do have some applicants who are from countries that have a three-year degree program. And this is acceptable in certain instances and um, not considered comparable in other instances. So the best thing to do is to go to this website, check out the country that you have your credential from, and each of these pages will list the degree title. And it is very specific and you can see if your degree from, and Christine is showing this page, let's look for, Let's do Australia. Okay. And you can see that it lists the different titles that are awarded by Australia. There we go. Um, acceptable, attested, uh, I'm sorry, um, comparable bachelor's degrees. And down here. There's a list of, there's a list of uh, four year degrees and there's a master's qualifying year after a three years bachelor's degree. So please do go and check your own country. And you can see here, it also shows that um, TOEFL is not required if you are from Australia. So that's another place that you can check whether you need to submit language proficiency requirements. Um, this, is a, this is a really um, excellent resource. Okay. All right. Should we get back? Okay, all right. So, and then this is, if you have to submit, the proficiency requirements. These are the numbers. So if you if you take TOEFL, um, that's the institution code. 1836 is the institution code that you report your scores to to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then there are you have to have if you take the IBT, it's got to be more than 102. So 103 and above is a full admission. Um, we don't see many students who take either CBT or PBT anymore, but those are, the, those are the numbers that you have to um, hit if you're using TOEFL. And then if you submit IELTS, then it has to be more than um, 7.5. Um, both those scores must be less than two years old. So if you have old scores, while we can look at it, we cannot use those old scores to um, process admissions and you may have to retake the test or we can also look at the um, exemptions to see if you're eligible. Christine, do we have that exemption on the slide deck? Um, so the exemption, it, I have it here. I just pulled up the website, okay. our website. So people can refer to this on the program website. Um, but the oh, exemption- the website. Mm -hmm. And it is also on the graduate college website base. Basically, there are two types of exemptions if you are considered an international student. One is that you have had a, a degree awarded in one of the eligible countries within the past five years. So for example, if I had, if I had earned a master's degree from, um, from the US in the last five years, I can be exempted, although originally I would have been considered, um, I would have been required to submit scores. And then the other part is if you had, even if you have not earned a degree, if you have had two years of um, education, a full-time educational um, experience in one of the eligible countries, you're again eligible to um, seek a waiver. The third one is based on your employment history. Again, these are, there are some countries that, get, that are eligible if you have at least two years of um, employment history. So those are the exemptions from TOEFL scores. If you have, again, questions, please ask us and we can look at your particular situation and um, let you know what is required and what can be what can be accepted as an exemption. Okay. Uh, next slide is tuition and financial aid. Okay. So the tuition uh, effective this fall will be $670 per credit hour. The uh, master's degree is a 32 credit hour degree. So that brings you in at about uh, 22,000, a little bit less uh, to complete the degree in tuition. Uh, in addition to that, there will also be some fees for, for example, cloud platform access. Uh, we have a deal with Amazon Web Services that provides students free credits. Um, uh, but if you wanna go over that and explore further, you might wanna um, uh, add credits to your Amazon Web account. Uh, same thing with Microsoft Azure. 
Um, the big thing is proctoring. So when we offer a course on this platform, um, we have uh, comprehensive examinations that are proctored and um, uh, uh, what works out best is an Uber-like model where the students arrange and arrange for the proctor and pay the proctor direct, directly through ProctorU. And that's on the order of, I don't know, $40, $60 per course, uh, depending on how many exams there are in the course. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a very small amount compared to uh, the tuition, um, but one that seems to work best uh, for, for the students uh, taking the class if they can schedule that directly instead of having a middleman that uh, adds time into the um, process. Financial aid, uh, I'll start and then you can pick up the, um, uh, the Master of Computer Science, that, uh, the degree and the MCSBS that we offer on the Coursera platform, um, uh, broadly uh, in an asynchronous format to uh, worldwide, has been accredited by the Higher Learning um, uh, HLC, uh, the Higher Learning uh, Consortium. And that uh, is the same group that accredits all degrees at the University of Illinois and all degrees in the Midwest. Um, the, the degree is fully accredited like every other degree we offer on campus. It is fully eligible for financial aid. And so if you want to apply for financial aid, for example, US federal funding for financial aid depends on that accreditation, but other uh, programs, employers may look at that. Um, uh, your own country may have uh, funding available for, for that. So um, uh, our, this, this is, uh, um, has the same eligibility for those financial aid packages. Um, we have a link later to our Office of Student Financial Aid, uh, and you can go to to find opportunities for financial aid. Uh, at the graduate level, there are some programs where students could receive assistantships or other funding from the department, fellowships, and so on. Uh, the computer science department does not offer any research or teaching assistantships to any of our online programs, and, and that's true across the um, College of Engineering. So that kind of uh, funding is not available for students in this program. Uh, part of our ability to deliver the program is based on the tuition dollars that go to um, pay for the program. And so, um, uh, so um, we don't have uh, funding from the department or the college available to, uh, to students in the program for that. On the other hand, um, uh, two other things about the finances of the program. One uh, is that the uh, tuition is significantly less expensive than, for example, our on-campus program. Our on-campus program charges the standard range-based tuition and an MCS degree it could be fifty, sixty thousand dollars uh, to get it on campus. Uh, in addition to housing costs and all the other costs and uh, fees, additional fees that our on-campus students have to pay that our online students don't. So you're getting quite a bargain at twenty-two thousand dollars of tuition. But the other is. Um, the design of the program. Uh, you're paying per credit hour and that's available to you in our online programs and that's something that's not available to our students on campus. Meaning if you're on campus and you need to take a semester off, something comes up uh, in life or at work um, or you need to do some travel or something like that, you need to take a semester away from your studies, um, you, you don't have to pay a thing. It's free. You don't have to pay that semester. If you're on campus, uh, that would be a zero credit hour um, semester and you would have to pay a couple thousand dollars in tuition even if you didn't take classes and that's that's part of the range based tuition for our on campus students that um, uh, we don't have to worry about uh, by delivering the program online. So, um, uh, so anyway, those are the uh, um, financial aspects of the degree and maybe uh, you can pick up from there and talk right. about uh, some of the other details. So, um, in terms of payments, um, let me first say, um, say that if you are uh, paying out of pocket and if you want to plan for the semester, there is an option where you can sign up for a payment plan so that your tuition is not um, due in one payment. And one thing that we also want to um, make clear is that a student will pay for the tu for the tuition only for the sem for that particular semester. So if I take one class a semester, then I would only be paying for that class that semester. It's the the full tuition for the program is not due upfront, which is a dif which is different compared to some of the other programs that we see online. Um, and then so you can sign up for a payment plan. There are three installment 
or no payment plans depending on when you sign up. So if you're admitted and if you're thinking of um, signing up for a payment plan, it is it is more strategic to do that early on so that you make you can make use of all the the installments that you have available for that for that semester. And we also have several of our students who are supported either by maybe their employers or they may find a scholarship. So, so the payment is made by a third party. And if you are in that situation, which would be a really nice place to be in, what there is an option that the university provides where your sponsor or your employer or your scholarship um, provider can be directly billed so that you do not have a payment or you do not have a bill due. For that, they have to be approved and registered at the university as a third party or sponsor uh, payee. We will show the link at the end to our, business, uh, to our campus office for um, student finances. And if you are in this situation, again, uh, please try to plan a little bit early so that you can get the necessary paperwork in and your sponsor can be built directly. Just as a heads up, the first step of this process is actually the responsibility of the student to apply for that plan. So it's you started and then it kind of gets kicked to, to, to your sponsor and it gets approved. So if, um, since we're also talking about uh, billing, let me also um, just make perfectly clear in case there's any misunderstanding. The courses we offer uh, as part of this degree program are credit bearing university courses. Uh, they meet the same requirements as our on campus courses. Uh, but the important thing is um, the courses consist of a, a couple of MOOCs, two of the MOOCs, for the classroom portion. So when you take a, a MOOC, um, uh, one of the uh, um, open courses that's available to, uh, to anybody, uh, to the general public, you're, you're doing the same thing as sitting in on one of our classes. Um, you're, you're getting the benefit of the learning, uh, of the lectures and so on, and maybe you can do a couple of the classroom assignments. That's only the tip of the iceberg. And when you sign up for one of these classes for university credit, you'll be receiving those same lectures, doing those same um, uh, classroom assignments, but you'll also be doing uh, full machine problems, programming problems, uh, homeworks. Um, you'll be working with other students uh, and the professor and the TA and the teaching staff. Um, uh, we have many different ways of connecting you with uh, other people in the program, both uh, online students and our students on campus. Um, and you'll be taking proctored exams uh, on the material, doing uh, class projects on the material. Uh, so there's a lot more that goes on with these classes. So these are full university classes, and so the actual cost of a class, if you took the two MOOCs on the platform, it might cost you 100 to $200 for the uh, lecture portion. But when you take it um, for credit with all this additional material, uh, it's going to cost you closer to $2,500, $2,600. Um, so just be aware of the difference in that. And then you're only paying for the courses you take as you take those courses. Um, just, just to make that uh, perfectly clear. The other benefit is, is uh, contact with the course staff. Um, um, you'll, you'll, you'll have office hours. Uh, you can come in and ask questions through office hours uh, online uh, with our teaching assistants and our faculty uh, who can add, answer each and every one of the questions that you might have on the material. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Um, so next we're going to jump into um, FAQ. Um, so we have a few slides of these. So either one of you, if you just want to go through, or do you want me to read them through? Yeah, why don't you read them and then, and then we can answer them. Okay, great. Okay, so first question is, what is the online MCS? Glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> so the online uh, MCS is our MCS degree. Uh, we have one MCS uh, program. Um, and that program is the same program that we offer on campus and uh, to our online students. Um, our online MCS is also um, in partnership with Coursera so that we offer the courses asynchronously in this scalable format that has worked really well. Um, and when we've, uh, when we've looked at the data from completion and, and, and uh, uh, student satisfaction, it has uh, significant increased uh, student satisfaction for that. We've been doing online education at the University of Illinois since the 60s. We've been doing it for over 50 years, 60 years now. Um, 
and we, uh, we've been offering the MCS online since the 90s. It was one of the first degrees uh, at the University of Illinois to, to be offered online. So we've been doing this for quite a while, but uh, we've learned a lot of, uh, of the details on how to do it right. And, um, and uh, we, we've got things quite nailed down with Coursera to be able to deliver this uh, in a very effective manner. Okay, so next question is, what is the MCSDS degree? Um, so the MCSDS is a, uh, the data sciences portion. It stands for Master of Computer Science in Data Science. Uh, the data sciences portion is a track of courses that satisfy all of the requirements for the MCS degree, but that focus on data sciences. Um, that helps, um, the, you know, um, in the next uh, 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 five years, uh, there's as many as 200,000 open jobs that will go unfilled in the data sciences because there aren't, isn't enough skilled labor uh, to fill that. And so we, we designed this course to be able to uh, provide that focus in data sciences for the students that want to do that. You can also take your MCS and focus on other areas. You could focus on software engineering and take our coursework in software engineering, programming languages, and parallel programming. Uh, we have the fastest parallel supercomputer on any college campus anywhere in the world. Um, and you can learn how to program something like that uh, through our parallel programming courses and software engineering courses. Um, and, and in a variety of other areas in scientific computing um, uh, and, uh, and a number of other uh, applications. Um, uh, and so that MCSDS is, a, uh, is just one of the focuses of the MCS degree. Uh, but there are others. Okay. Uh, what will appear on the diploma or transcript? So the degree is just Master of Computer Science. When you get your diploma when you, and the transcript that represents your diploma, um, when you send your transcript to, uh, to somebody, all that it will say is that you received the Master of Computer Science from the College of Engineering at the University of Illinois. Um, the, you, that's the same thing that's said for our on-campus students, for our online students. There won't be anything about uh, taking the, getting the degree online on the diploma or the transcripts because we have one degree. Um, we make sure that uh, the courses and uh, the, the program that we offer online meets the exact same requirements as our on-campus courses and program. Okay. Um, how is an online MCS course offered using the Coursera MOOC platform? Good, good. And as I mentioned before, each of our courses consists of about two MOOCs worth of uh, classroom uh, experience. Uh, those will be video lessons. And the video lessons are in kind of bite-sized pieces so that uh, um, you'll, you'll learn um, a lesson in about uh, five to 15 minutes of some, um, um, some element of the course. And you can, um, you know, you can catch one of these in a morning commute on the train, or you can binge watch all of them in a weekend if you have to. Uh, it's quite flexible. Uh, it can work around whatever schedule you have. Um, and so that MOOC content is, is, is kind of the tip of the iceberg. And then there's all of the uh, interaction with the teaching staff through office hours uh, with other students. That's where the real learning happens. And then we evaluate that with uh, um, uh, homeworks, uh, projects, MPs, uh, machine problems, which are programming problems, and proctored examinations, and all of the background you'll need in order to complete all of that. Okay. How are the online MCS courses different than the typical Coursera MOOC course? That's a good question. So the uh, um, uh, one way is uh, they cost more uh, because of all that additional um, uh, assessment and interaction that's supported by the uh, by the course, uh, the additional material that you get. Uh, so, um, a Coursera uh, um, a MOOC course, a massively open course uh, consisting of just the lectures, is on the order of a hundred to two hundred dollars for the same material uh, for that lecture material. But um, when we offer it um, uh, with instructor interaction and uh, all the additional assessment, uh, it'll it'll be about ten times that. It's about two thousand. Uh, $2,500 uh, for that. But for that, you are getting university credit. So that's one difference. Uh, the other difference is the amount of depth that you get. Uh, we um, were able to cover the material in significantly more depth uh, than we are in the open content version of the course. And we have projects that will help you um, firm up your knowledge 
and not only do that, but signal that you have that knowledge through the uh, completion of the course credit and the degree. Okay. Let's see. Next question is, do the two Coursera MOOC courses and four credit portion need to be taken concurrently? Yeah, that's the best way to do it. Um, even though the lessons, uh, the video lessons will be the same, what we do is we take those, uh, the content from those two more MOOC courses and we put them together in one MOOC that will be available to you as a University of Illinois student. Um, and that allows us to incorporate some additional notes, some additional things. Uh, so it's always best to just uh, take it all at once. That's the best way, the most effective way to learn the material. If you've already taken the Coursera MOOCs prior to the course, and there, you know, the, the lectures from these things are just publicly available as MOOCs, uh, you can do that. Um, if, there's, um, uh, if the material has been revised, um, we, we go back and we uh, add material to these things. There's a chance it could have changed by the time you take the course. And then you, you often have to go back and re-remember some things that you may have forgotten. And so um, uh, any, any classroom exercises you've taken in the previous MOOC version of the course will count towards the uh, four credit version of the course. If you've taken a quiz, that will transfer in as long as the quiz hasn't changed. But, um, you know, uh, depending on how long ago you took the MOOC, it may have revised and more and more of your classroom exercises may no longer be uh, counted towards the four credit portion if they've been updated. So there's a risk to doing that, but by all means, uh, we don't want you to have to do the same exercises twice. So if you've already done them once, uh, that's in the system and we will uh, uh, import that in so that you get credit for it and don't have to repeat that. But the, 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 the best way to learn this material is to just do it all at once. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next slide of FAQ. Okay, so this is a question we get quite often. I completed a Coursera specialization. Will I earn graduate credit at the University of Illinois? No. Um, you do get a certificate from the University of Illinois that signifies you completed that specialization. And our Coursera specializations are consist, consist of these MOOCs that are open to the general public. Um, and they have exercises and classroom exercises um, that you might take in, in the actual classroom, but don't have the level of uh, uh, rigor, the, the machine problems, the homeworks, the pro class projects, and the uh, uh, proctored examinations that we need to uh, ensure that uh, the students have, uh, have the depth of the knowledge needed to confer graduate credit. So, um, uh, so, so the answer is no, but that's another, those uh, certificates that you get for completing a specialization are a great signal that you, you have been through that material. Um, it's just uh, a different than, uh, than what you get in transcripted uh, university credit. Okay. Next questions. Are students expected to be proficient in a particular programming language? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, not a particular programming language. Most students have had Python before. Um, uh, when you are a graduate student in a computer science master's program, or any graduate uh, program in computer science, and even, even our uh, 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 undergraduates after a few years, um, you get to the point where you can pick up a new programming language as needed. And the idea is that you don't have a favorite programming language necessarily that you're going to make work with every application you want to do. Uh, the important thing is to learn to be able to use the best tool to solve the problem. And that uh, tool in this case is a programming language and some, you know, some applications like in machine learning, some applications might be solved better with Python or with the R programming languages or even MATLAB um, uh, if you're doing scientific computing. Whereas if you're working in uh, software engineering production, you might be working in C++ or in uh, uh, Java. Um, and there's a, there's a whole wealth of other programming languages out there that are particularly well suited for, uh, for other particular uh, problems. And so you'll get to the point where you can just pick up a new language. Once you've learned your first language, the elements of these other programming languages often have similarities, and so it's, it's fairly easy to learn the second, third, fourth, and then you can just pick up a new language uh, um, as easily as, uh, as anything else. Okay. How do students apply for the online MCS or MCSDS? Um, so the application is uh, available through the University of Illinois website. 
there will be a link to that website. You need to fill out the application. There's no difference in the application for MCS or MCSDS. You're applying for the MCS program. You'll be accepted into the MCS program. And, um, and once there, it's up to you if you want to take the courses that focus on data sciences, then you'll be completing the MCSDS. But uh, if you want to focus on a different area, you're welcome to do that too. You've been admitted into the MCS program. With that said, when you fill out the application, uh, one of the most important things you can do is to verify your background, uh, particularly in this area of data structures. Um, and so uh, there'll be an opportunity on the application, especially for the MCS, for you to fill in your uh, background knowledge in data structures, algorithms, um, object-oriented programming, linear algebra, and statistics. And especially for data structures, um, for example, uh, you'll get the opportunity to fill in the, uh, the course name, the course number, your grade, um, and, and uh, where you took the course and when you took the course. Uh, fill all of that information in because we'll be referring to the information in those boxes as we uh, look at your prerequisites. Uh, especially uh, put the, the rubric number um, and the name of the course into that box and that'll give you your best chance at uh, uh, getting that material evaluated properly in your application. Okay. Um, let's see. What if my undergraduate GPA is less than a 3.0? Yeah, I'm seeing that question a lot also in the Q&A. In fact, I'm seeing a lot of these questions in the Q&A, so um, uh, we can answer this here. Uh, we, will, we will do a holistic approach to uh, evaluating your application. We're gonna look at everything. Um, in some cases, a GPA that's uh, lower than expected can be countered by other experience, um, the environment. Uh, one of the things we look for is grit. Um, uh, did you uh, persevere and succeed um, without maybe some of the privileges that other students uh, may have had in, in your education? That's very important to us as well, and we'll take that into consideration. Um, the other thing you can do for a GPA that's less than 3.0 is you can take some additional classes. Maybe you have some classes available at a community college, especially a data structures class. That's a great way to take your data structures class if you don't have it already, is to take it at a local community, community college. And then we'll look at your most recent grades, um, especially if your um, prior grade uh, point average was, uh, was less than 3.0. Okay. Do international students in this program receive an I-20? Um, <clears throat> sorry. So because this is an online program and it is all online 100%, you would not have to come on campus for any of the requirements, although you, you're certainly welcome to come on campus, for example, for commencement. Um, because it's an online program, the university does not offer I-20s for any of our online programs. And that is because you, the student is not expected to be on campus. So therefore, if this question comes connected to what are my options to do CPT or OBT as an international student, um, unfortunately, these programs will not give you that pathway. What you can do is once you have this degree, which is credentialed the same way as any of our <coughs> other masters of computer science programs, to use this, for example, to seek an employer-based visa. So that's a long answer to that short question that I-20 will not be um, <coughs> issued. So, thank you. Okay. One more slide of FAQs. Um, will non-degree seeking students be able to take online MCS courses? Yes, but the uh, criteria to be able to take a course as a non-degree graduate student is exactly the same criteria to be admitted into the MCS program. So, um, uh, you're welcome to join the MCS program. Um, if you want to take a non-degree um, course as an individual course, uh, you can do that, but you'd still have to fill out an application. Okay. Is financial aid available for online MCS students? So, yes, it is. Uh, federal financial aid is available. It's a fully accredited program, um, just like any other uh, graduate degree we offer on this campus but the, the department and the college don't have things like assistantships or fellowships or scholarships available for students uh, okay. in this program. So you'd have to find funding outside the uh, uh, department or college for that. 
Okay. So last FAQ question, when will applications for the next admission cycle open? Um, so I'll be asking about spring of 2019 then? Yes. Um, so we close applications on <clears throat> May 30th and it will probably have about a two to three week period of gap and then we will open it for the um, spring 2020 applications. Thank you, Christine. So those are the deadlines. Um, if you start looking in um, late June, you should see the spring applications open. Okay. So we have here um, the entry point, when to submit that dead, uh, application for that entry point and when decisions will be announced. And then we also have where this information lives. Application deadlines is always posted on the website, the program website. Um, and then final slide is where to find information. So here are all the links that we've used today. Um, the application link, program websites, requirements by country, TOEFL ILS waiver information, um, again, application deadlines. And then if you have additional questions, please email them to mcs at cs.illinois.edu. There are currently 184 open questions and we only have five minutes left. So, so here's one. Uh, so uh, somebody uh, is talking about the, uh, uh, the MOOC sequence for CS fundamentals and the entrance exam. So let me take a moment to, to get Perfect. some on that. Um, we have we get a tremendous number of applications that we of, of people we want to welcome into the program and can't uh, because of the prerequisites. We the last thing we want to do is to admit anybody into the program that uh, um, that doesn't have the prerequisites to be able to succeed in our courses. That's that's not good for anybody. Um, uh, and so we've had to turn away some really good students, really good applicants that don't have, for example, data structures. And, um, uh, and, and tell them to, to pick up a data structures course someplace. So um, for that, what we've done is we've developed an entrance exam. So if you're missing the documentation for background knowledge in, uh, in the fundamentals of computer science, the prerequisite knowledge, we have an entrance exam that we're gonna be rolling out this summer. That could be an option for you to verify your knowledge of the CS fundamentals. And uh, we also have a, a MOOC specialization sequence of three courses, largely drawn from our uh, CS 225 data structures course uh, on these fundamentals that can help you prepare for that entrance exam. We're, we're rolling that out this summer. We'll send out information about that option to you. It's something you can take under consideration. If you go ahead and apply and we, de we determine that you're missing uh, that proper documentation of those prerequisites, we'll give you further information on how you can utilize those, uh, that pathway to admissions in the BMCS. Okay. Let's see, so many questions. Okay, so if we don't get to your questions, which we probably won't. <laughs> because yeah, I I've been answering a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, uh, through the through text and I think we uh, a lot of the ones were very similar to the frequently answered question mm -hmm. um, let's see um, so John there are some questions in here about taking prerequisite courses uh, via MOOCs or specializations can you speak to how does that compare if they took it for graded transcripted credit yeah yeah so um, uh, obviously, the important thing is to have the knowledge, but we also need to verify that the students coming in have that knowledge. And the best way to verify that a student uh, um, understands the material is through graded university credit, graded college credit, transcriptable credit. So if you can point to a data structures class that you've had um, uh, at the university or college where you got your undergraduate, or maybe it's a um, non-degree credit that you've taken since your degree, that may be a course you picked up at a local community college, that's great. Um, that gives us a grade, that gives us uh, uh, something that we can point to, to to make sure that you have that. A lot of students want to use uh, on-the-job experience um, or um, specialization sequences. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't have an indication of how well the material is, is known from, from those. Uh, um, there's no grade, it's uh, uh, specialization sequences are completed or not, but we don't get an indication of how well the material 
for how deep the material has been covered. And, and also we don't get that indication from on, on the job uh, work. So uh, that's why we formulated the entrance exam so that we get something we can point to that gives us an indication that you know the material well enough to be able to succeed in these courses. And that's, that's really uh, the crux of, of that decision. We don't want you, we don't want to put anybody uh, in a situation where they feel underwater and struggling because we didn't do a good job of making sure they had the, the proper prerequisite knowledge. And through that uh, specialization sequence and entrance exam, that's one way we can assure everybody involved that, uh, that uh, the incoming students know that material well enough to succeed in the courses. Okay, so we are at the top of the hour. Um, so that concludes this webinar. Again, if you have questions that we couldn't get to, um, please do send us an email at mcs at cs.illinois.edu. And we will try to respond to them uh, within the next few days, except for the weekend. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> next week. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody for joining us. Again, this was recorded and it will be sent to you um, via email. Thank Great, you. Thanks. thanks so much. Thank you.